we just reach out to God right now? Come on, just as we get, open our hearts to Him. We're gonna be talking about the table of forgiveness and right now there's a table in front of us and what a beautiful table it is. Father in heaven, we thank You. We thank You, Lord, for Your presence this morning. Father, every heart open, blessing. God, as we sit at this table, You have all sorts of amazing things to give us, free of charge. And God, we just commit this time into Your hands, Lord. We open our hearts to the goodness of God, to the Gospel, to the life of Jesus. Father, we thank You, Lord, that in You we are forgiven and grace pours out upon our lives and peace that flows from that. God, we give You praise and honour and glory. We thank You for Your majesty. Father, fill this house. Thank You for 2022. Thank You for 2023. is gonna be the best year that this church has ever experienced and every home represented in it, in Jesus' Name. And everyone said, Amen. Come on, give the Lord a big hand. Maybe a Christmas shout, what do you reckon? Oh, very good. You may be seated. Say hi to someone on the way down. You know, this morning I woke up and a book fell on my head, but I've only got my shelf to blame. Yeah, yeah. I think I'll just stop right there. I had a whole bunch of more, but anyway, it's all good. We're doing, um, we're doing this series on Christmas at the table. And I know we've done, we've talked about the table of restoration. And this morning, we're gonna be talking about the table of forgiveness. Anybody glad here that we're forgiven? And this incredible story of Jesus at the table. I love the fact that Jesus loves tables and that He produces these incredible tables. We're gonna be reading from uh, Luke chapter seven. I'm just gonna read you the story and then we're gonna unpack this together. And I'm gonna read from verse 34 of Luke seven. It says there, the Son of Man came eating and drinking. Oh, who loves the fact that Jesus loves eating and drinking? Anyone <laughs> who's about to do a lot of that this Christmas? Eating and drinking and you say, here's a glutton and a drunkard. He was criticised for this, a friend of tax collectors and sinners, but wisdom has proved right by all her children. Verse 36, when one of the Pharisees invited Jesus to have dinner with Him, I I have a personal commentary on this one. I think Simon was criticising, he was one of the people criticising Jesus for for who he was eating with. And here Simon says, "I I want to invite you to a real table. I want you to invite you to a table that I think the people that you should be eating with. That was probably his reason for it. And then it goes on and he says, Jesus reclined at the table. A woman in that town who lived a sinful life learned that Jesus was eating at the Pharisee's house. So she came there with an alabaster jar of perfume. As she stood behind him at his feet weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears. Then she wiped them with her hair kissed them and poured perfume on them. When the Pharisees who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would know who is touching him and what kind of woman she is, that she is a sinner. Jesus answered, Simon, I have something to tell you. Tell me, teacher, he said. You imagine the sarcasm in Simon's voice. Tell me, teacher. He said, two people owed money to a certain money lender. One owed him 500 denarii, the other 50. Neither of them had the money to pay pay him back. So he forgave the debts of both. Now, which of them would love him more? Simon replied, I suppose the one who had the bigger debt forgiven. You have judged correctly, Jesus said. Then he turned toward the woman and said to Simon, do you see this woman? I came into her house. You did not give me any water for my feet, but she wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. He did not give me a kiss, but this woman from the time I entered has not stopped kissing my feet. You did not put oil on my head, but she has poured perfume on my feet. Therefore I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven as her great love has shown. But whoever has been forgiven little, loves little. Then Jesus said to her, your sins are forgiven. 
the other guests began to say among themselves, who is this who even forgives sins? Jesus said to the woman, your faith has saved you, go in peace. What a great story, incredible. I'm good, thank you, Mitch. Come on, give it up for Mitch. Great job, mate. I just realised this beautiful lulling music in the background there, it's incredible. I love this story. I love the fact that Jesus was a person who changed up things and did things differently. Jesus came eating and drinking. The Son of Man came eating and drinking. Do you realise that there's only three times in the Gospels that it says Jesus came? He came to seek and save the lost. He came to give His life as a ransom for many. Both those are His mission. But His method was He came eating and drinking. I love the fact that Jesus didn't come and try to build institutional things and and create religious systems and structures. Guess what He came? He came and eating and drinking and hanging out with people. Who loves that sort of gospel anyway? (laughs) And and the, the power of this table, the thing that this connection with Jesus, Jesus wants a connection with us and He lays these tables out in front of us. And we've talked about a lot of tables over the last few weeks, but I think this morning's table is the most important table, the table of forgiveness. And that, that, that incredible table is laid out before us. Tim Chester, this New Testament writer says this, Jesus had no office, headquarters or building, no home to speak of. He had meals, the sea, the mountain and the desert. That was, his, that, was his, that was his frame of reference. It was amazing. Jesus' ministry strategy, watch this, was a long meal. Robert Carra says this, in Luke's Gospel, Jesus is either going to a meal, at a meal, or coming from a meal. Meals are pretty important. And it's interesting, in many ways, this approach of Jesus is a picture of what is coming in the future of the Kingdom. That we're gonna have a very long meal in the return of Christ. It's called the Marriage Supper of the Lamb. Do you realise the first many, many years of the Kingdom of God coming on earth is gonna be a very huge long meal, a long table and a very massive party. Come on, who wouldn't wanna be part of that Kingdom? Anybody excited about that? That's, that the, the, the meal defines the Kingdom of God and the table defines that. What happens at the table? Christine Pohl, another great writer says this, a shared meal is the activity mostly tied to the reality of God's kingdom. There's something that happens when we eat together. That's why I love uh, Natalie's uh, comments and next step, which is awesome because it's the connect group. But at connect groups, we, we eat together, we, we share meals together, we, we do stuff together. There's something profound that happens at the table and we're gonna be eating at the table this week, which is amazing. Table fellowship is, was of tremendous significance in first century life. It meant so many things. It meant welcome, it meant acceptance, it meant friendship, it meant community. And yet, unfortunately, even in today's society, much of the table is being reduced. Accordingly, uh, apparently, in the last three decades, in Western society, 33% of families eat less together. I have no idea how they figure that stat out. (laughs) You know, and then apparently 45% of singles eat less together. But then then on the other hand, 87% of statistics are made up on the spot, you know. Including that one there, of course. But there is, a, there is definitely a less people eating together. I think, I, to be honest with you, I think we need a revival of the table. There are a revival of eating and connecting and fellowshipping one another. I think one of the greatest things that's happening in church life is there's a, a revival of community. And bu- God is building that back. Anybody excited about that? And, and why don't why me this Christmas? Why don't we have another, have, why don't we start at this Christmas and revival around that? And Jesus was the example of that. The Pharisees didn't criticise Jesus for eating, but for who He ate with. Every time Jesus ate with someone, He was sending a message, you're included in the Gospel. Whoever He ate with, usually the rejected, usually the ones on the outside, He was saying to them, you are included in the Gospel. Anybody glad that they're included? We are included. So here we have this great story. And really it's a story of the table of forgiveness. And I love the fact that The beginning of the night started great. Simon was happy. The celebrity that he thought was a celebrity was invited. Jesus responded and he's sitting, he's actually reclining at the table. The tables weren't like our tables now. They were actually very low uh, and there were cushions around the table. 
uh, and Jesus was probably leaning on his left elbow with his feet behind him. So it's very, very low. And the, the night began well. So far, so good. Jesus looks relaxed. The guest of honour looks relaxed and things are looking good until a woman sat down. Well, actually she didn't sit down. She arrived in the room and people were invited. She wasn't an invited guest. She, wasn't, she was not certainly included in this evening, but these particular meals that they had in this part of history, they would, they would uh, have the meal together and they would leave the doors open. And anybody who wanted to join the conversation or listen to the conversation later on and the down out, you know, outpouring of teaching later on in the evening, they could come in and into the house. Well, guess who walked in? This particular woman. And suddenly the night wasn't going according to plan. It started well, but now it wasn't going well. And here's this woman, she arrived and, and she began to weep and her tears were so profuse that there was so much tears coming out of her that there was enough to wash the feet of Jesus. She let her hair down, which was, she was probably a street worker. So this was a very, very awkward moment. Suddenly the night turned extremely awkward. Suddenly the night, the tension, imagine the tension in the room as, as these judgmental Pharisees were there looking at this woman and she would not have felt welcome. She would have, she would have with fear and trepidation walked into that room, yet her thankfulness and gratitude was so great that it overcame her sense of rejection, her sense of not being included. And her tears were so great and there was so much and there's so much gratitude in there, the atmosphere would have been charged with tension and yet incredible connection between this woman and Jesus. She has, as we read in the story, she had an alabaster jar of perfume. Very expensive. It was probably one of the tools of her trade. And yet what she did, she, they had no screw tops on these jars. You had to break the top of the jar open. And once it was open, it was open. And the fragrance just spilled through that room, which is incredible. And she didn't just dab a few bits of it of, of perfume on Jesus' feet. She actually poured it out. And it represents almost like her whole, whole old life being broken off and can be completely poured out on the feet of Jesus. Imagine the smell through that. The aroma of thanksgiving and the aroma of gratitude is a sweet smelling uh, smell to the, to, the, to the Kingdom of God. And what an amazing, amazing time. And then it says, uh, the, and as she did that, such awkwardness would have been in there as opposed to the inhospitable and judgmental attitude of the Pharisees. And so the symposium begins. The lesson, the object lesson begins. Jesus thought this is a great opportunity. The Pharisees didn't say anything. Simon didn't say anything, but the, the sense Jesus read their mind and the sense that, that they were judging her became very clear. So Jesus said, all right, let me, let me share a story with you. There were two people that owed. One was 50 denarii and another one was 500 denarii. 50 denarii represents 10 months wages. That's a decent amount. If you think about that, 500 denarii is eight years wages. And here is Jesus basically saying to Simon the Pharisee and to the woman that these both debts are huge. But and neither are payable. No matter how big or small the debt is, the debt we owe Christ, the debt we owe God is unpayable. And yet, guess what? Both were paid. This message really is to both the Simon the Pharisee and to the sinful woman. And yet, in many ways, Simon lost sight of what was being presented to him. Both debts were forgiven. And here's the deal. Forgiveness is the only answer in the Kingdom of God. Forgiveness is the only way we can, we can receive the, the presence of God and the kingdom of God. Forgiveness is the only answer, irris irrespective of the size of our debt. Her genuine sorrow, love and thankfulness which showed the revelation of forgiveness that was happening in her life. And that's what forgiveness looks like. That's what gratitude looks like. I, I believe it wasn't just tears of sorrow. This were tears of joy. There, was, there would have been like, exuberation in her heart. She was so overwhelmed with the thankfulness towards God, which is amazing. This is what forgiveness looks like. D.L. Moody said this, a great many people want to bring their faith, their works, their good deeds to Him for salvation. 
But He says, bring your sins and He will bear them away into the wilderness of forgetfulness and you will never see them again. Isn't that good news? Come on, give the Lord a hand. He is amazing. I believe she was experiencing what Paul wrote about later in the book of Ephesians, chapter two, which, where he says, all of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath. But because of His great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even when we we're dead in our transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. Oh my gosh, thank God for the grace of God, right? And God raised us up with Christ, here we go, and seated us, there's the table again, with Him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus, in all that in the coming ages, He might show the incomparable riches of His grace, expressed in His kindness to us in Christ Jesus, for it is by grace you've been saved through faith. This is not a work of ourselves, my gosh. That's what she, she was like, like living out and expressing and experiencing what I believe Paul wrote about at that particular time. And I love the fact that Jesus said, your sins are forgiven, go in peace. The result of forgiveness, ultimately the aim that God has for us is the peace of God. Peace is one of the most elusive things in society. One of the things that people are struggling, I want peace, we want world peace, we want peace in our circumstances, we want peace in our relationships, but ultimately God offers us peace in our hearts as we receive the forgiveness of God. It's the only access point. I love Romans 5.1, it says, having been justified with God, we have peace with God. Oh my gosh, anybody excited by that? Peace with God, we have that access to that peace. You know, years ago, when I was 16 years of age, uh, we were down the South Coast. Every summer we'd go surfing down the South Coast and we spent a month down there. And it was a great time. At this point, I wasn't a Christian. I didn't understand Christianity or the Gospel. Even though I was raised somewhat in a religious home, I had no revelation of God's love for me. And in, at, at that particular place, that campsite where we used to go surfing, and spend a month, there was a Christian camp organisation that used to uh, come and spend another two weeks of that month in the same campsite. And there were Christ- young Christians and they used to have meetings and a massive tent and they used to invite people to these meetings. Well, I used to go to these meetings just to sort of harass uh, these Christians and I'd, I'd purposely get into conversations uh, with, the, uh, with the Christians in this particular group and I'd you know, argue evolution versus creation. And I thought of myself as a sort of a, a, a budding young scientist. I mean, I really wasn't that clever, but I'd get in these conversations, we'd have these arguments and, and, and then, uh, and so three of them, st- Maybe they obviously saw me as a, a bit of a mission and they started connecting with me. They started uh, telling me about the love of Jesus. They basically were inviting me to this table of forgiveness. Well, I wasn't interested at all. And they, but they just kept at me. They, just, they, wouldn't, they would not let me alone. I'd get up in the morning to come out of the uh, caravan that we're, we're staying in and they'd be camped there right outside the, the door of the caravan at like 6.30, 7 o'clock in the morning as I was getting for a surf. And then they'd follow me. And then so I started getting up earlier and earlier. Uh, every day, I, I, you know, I was getting up, but eventually I was surfing at 2 a.m. in the morning. And uh, <laughs> No, I'd get up early to beat them to the surf, to beat them so they, they weren't there, there um, to witness to me. So then I, and then they started meeting me down the beach. They realised I'd already gone surfing, so they would come down to the beach and literally camp themselves on the sand while I was surfing. And I could see them. I'm like, I'm not coming in. <laughs> I'm not coming in. I'm, I'm, I, so I used to have one hour surfs, then I'd have two hour surfs and three hour surfs. Eventually I was surfing like 18 hours a day. I'm like, I'm not coming in, but eventually I had to go in. And so they'd come in from the surf and they're like, hi, how are you? And they'd say, do you know, Jesus loves you. I'm like, yeah, I think so. And anyway, this happened all summer. Guess what? The same three people joined that same Christian group the following year and they were there again the following summer. So two to three summers in a row, the same people every day saying to me, Jesus loves you. God was laying this table of forgiveness, but I wasn't responding. 
God, God, I think, gives us these incredible opportunities. He's inviting us to the table. Everyone's included in this, but it didn't quite click. Four years later, when I was 20 years of age, my sister, thought she, well, I'm gonna, she met Christ and she invited me to the table and she invited me to a meeting at Sydney Town Hall and it was listening to a, 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 a born again, spirit-filled Catholic priest and he basically just pre- preached the gospel, the table of fellowship and, and opened up again to me. And halfway through that message, my sister turned to me and said, what do you think? And I said, I'm in. <laughs> And I received the meal and I'm like instantly this overwhelming sense of peace came in me. Took, took four years for that to happen, but I eventually sat down and had a meal at that table and received God's forgiveness. And that was 45 years ago. The presence of God came. I'm telling you, God has invited you to this table. God has all sorts of things for you at this table. Peace is the result. Peace, when, when Jesus said, go in peace, what is that peace? It's shalom, it's completeness, soundness, well-being. God wants this sense of peace that we just literally take from this sense of forgiveness out into that place. Imagine this Christmas as you, as you know you're forgiven. Now we could talk about forgiving others, but really this morning's thing is about God forgiving us. And as, as we're forgiven, then we, we recognise that we can then take the peace that comes from that out into every situation we go into. I love that. I love this great quote. It says, because of the world's chaos through man's sin, because peace comes only as God's gift. The messianic hope was an age of peace. Or I love this, the advent of the Prince of Peace. You know, we are in Advent right now. Advent is the preparation for Christmas. It is the the lead up to what Christmas is. And if Christmas brings anything, can bring anything, it's the peace of God. And it's not just a sense of calmness. No, it's a deep sense on the inside. And this is what this woman experienced. And she experienced that great peace. Just on a side note, I think Simon could have also received that forgiveness. He talked the two stories. He said, the person who owed 500 denarii, obviously referring to the woman. And then the guy, the person who owed 50 denarii, obviously referring to Simon. But neither debt could be paid. And he's like, both were forgiven. And at that moment, I think Simon could have said, I'm that guy. She's that person, but I'm that guy. Can I get forgiveness as well? But he didn't. He didn't respond to that that appeal. And I also have a little theory that he and the woman could have reconciled in peace and finished the meal together. Imagine that experience where, where actually he invited her to the table and said, come on, stay for the meal. And let's eat together because then, because only the cross is only complete when not only do we receive forgiveness, but we then release forgiveness to others. That's the completion of the cross. You know, I, I love T.D. Jake's uh, description of this, description of forgiveness. Forgiveness, he says, like breathing. As we, rec- as we breathe in the forgiveness from God, we breathe out forgiveness to others. And, and this beautiful cycle of I'm forgiven, I forgive. I'm forgiven, I forgive. Uh, and and what, a, what an opportunity that could have been for Simon at that point, not only to receive the forgiveness of Jesus, but to release it into that woman and the restoration. Who knows what happened to Simon in the future? But, uh, but who knows? I believe that maybe he received Christ at some point, but that was the opportunity. But she left with the peace of God pouring out. I, I, it would have been great if Jesus said, not go in peace, but stay in peace and stay amongst and let's fellowship together. But as we, uh, I believe, you know, Christmas is defined by so many things, presents, trees, ornaments, incredible stuff that Christmas is, but I believe Christmas probably is most defined by the Christmas meal. And I'm believing that our Christmas meals this year, maybe even if they've got a, a history of tension or a history of conflict, that and, and maybe peace won't happen between people, but we'll bring the sense of peace as we know our place in God and we are invited and included in the presence of God in that place. Amen, who believes that? Come in, why don't we just stand to our feet right now? As we finish, maybe I could have the band. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Why don't we lift our hands to God right now and ask God to touch us. Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit. I want you to imagine a beautiful table spread out by Jesus 
laid in front of you right now and is including you, has included you in that place. God's presence, God's peace. Maybe right now, why don't you begin to thank God for the incredible forgiveness that He's already bestowed upon us. Thank You, Jesus. Why don't you begin to lift our voice right now and say, thank You, Lord. I am included. I am forgiven. In Jesus' mighty Name. Father, we thank You right now. Holy Spirit, just begin to express thankfulness to God for what you've experienced, the forgiveness that we have in Him. In Jesus' mighty Name, Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit. Father, we thank You. The presence of God fills our hearts, our lives. Thank You, Lord, no matter what we've done, Your forgiveness overwhelms and touches our lives to a point of incredible gratitude. And God, we give You all the praise and all the glory. And like that woman, Lord, our hearts are broken with thankfulness. In the mighty Name of Jesus, we give You praise and honour and glory and majesty. We give You praise right now. Thanks so much for joining us today. If you wanna know more about Jesus, about our church, or if you're in Sydney and would like to plan a visit, head to our website, c3syd.church and find a C3SYD location near you. You can also follow us on Instagram at c3.syd. Subscribe to our messages on YouTube and listen to our podcast too. See you soon.